Amen. If you have it, say amen. 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 If you're ready to hear the word of God this morning, say amen. 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 The word of God reads as follows. After these things, the Lord appointed other seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whether he himself would come. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest is truly great, yeah. but the laborers are few. Yeah. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, baby. Yeah. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, oh God, I thank you and I praise you. Lord, I give you all the glory. Father, just ask you, dear Father God, that you uh, allow me to expound upon this text. Yeah. Yeah. That every ear that hears will understand. Yeah, and every heart that hears will receive. Yes. Lord, this can only be done by your power and by your might. Yes. So I pray for the Spirit's power at this moment. And use me for your honor and for your glory. Yes. In Jesus' name, Lord, I do pray. Amen. 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 Today is the National Baptist Convention National Evangelism Day. So uh, back in the spring when I was in Baltimore, uh, they were advertising this, uh, asking the churches within the convention that on this day set it aside for a focus upon evangelism. And the text that was set aside was this particular text that we're reading this morning, Luke chapter number uh, Luke chapter 10, verse number 2. And so that is what I want to look at today. Amen? Amen? Let me remind you of what the text says so that we have it fresh within our minds and within our hearts. The Word of God said that the harvest is great. It's plentiful. But it's the laborers yeah. that are few. Yeah. The text instructs us to pray to the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth the laborers into the harvest. If you read the Holy Christian Standard Bible, when verse number three comes around, the next two words you read is, now go. That is the instruction that we have as believers, that we are to go and do this. But before we examine this text this morning, and especially to my, my senior, more mature adults in the room, you might catch this illustration before we get started. How many of you remember Kirby vacuum cleaners? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all remember the, the the salesman coming out to the door, and he wanted to get into your house so that he can vacuum your floor and show you how much your other vacuum cleaner ain't picking up. He was sent out by the Kirby company to tell you about a product yeah. that he believed that you needed. And he did everything in his power to convince you yeah. to sign your life over. I mean, sign up. <laughs> to sign up and, and to get this vacuum plan. And if you wasn't signing your life over, you was coming out your pocket for an extreme amount of money for just a vacuum cleaner. Amen. How many good times people I got in the house? All right. yeah. Amen. Good times is one of those all-time favorite shows. As a matter of fact, you, you can't be, you can't have your black card if you ain't watch good times. <laughs> if you don't love good times, you got to have your card revoked. That's just not allowed in the community. Amen? Amen. 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 But there was this particular episode in good times. As a matter of fact, I looked it up so I can have the exact reference, just in case you want to go look it up. But it's season two, episode eight, that took place on October 29th, 1970. Wow. And if you remember that, that Michael, the smart one, yeah. Michael, the clever one, yeah. he, he, he went to the door, he answered the door, and this blind guy was at the door. Yeah. This guy, he came by because he had something to say. He had to say, he wanted to sell uh, encyclopedias. <laughs> and, and back in the day, especially during those times, and, and in the, the confines of Chicago or, or the Good Times episode, 
to buy a set of encyclopedias was an expensive thing. But it was something that Michael admired. And Michael wanted those encyclopedias. And you, you can watch the episodes, you know that the guy was blind and he was really trying to rip them off, but that's not the point. Yeah. The point is that you understand because that was an actual thing that was taking place within the world. There were people who were making a living off of going forth, forth and, and, and selling Encyclopedia Britannicas to households across the nation. The ideal in the mind of Encyclopedia uh, Britannica, that company, what, what they thought was, there is, it is a, let me say it this way, a harvest full of people who need these books. So let us find people to walk the streets, go door to door, and tell them about these encyclopedias. And if you recall, if they ever came to your house, they told you about how this would enhance the education of your children, how this would, would better your household and make everyone smarter. And they made it seem like if you had these encyclopedias in your house, your house was better than the house next door. <laughs> As a matter of fact, they would often say, I just left so-and-so house. Right. And yeah. they bought a set as well. Yeah. Now, don't you want a set for your house? That this is what these companies did back in the 70s. You had different uh, companies doing different things, sending people out door to door and house to house. As a matter of fact, even in my younger days, I dibbled and dabbled in some of this salesman. How many of you ever heard of Cutco Civil, uh, uh, Cutco um, knives and uh, cutlery and all that type of stuff? Yeah, I sold those. But that didn't go too well. <laughs> so I had to move on from them. I even dabbled in a little bit of selling um, a cemetery property. Now that's something everybody needs. Sooner or later, everybody is going to need a cemetery plot. You're going to need a vault. You're going to have to pay for your opening and your closing. You're going to have to pay for all those uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the things that most people don't know about until a death comes. So they trained me to go into people's houses and tell them of the need for them to purchase prepaid cemetery uh, insurance so that they, they would have to leave their loved ones to deal with all of these costs in their most grieving hours of their lives because they needed it. This is the picture that we have here in our text today. This is the, the imagery that Jesus Christ is setting up before us today. Wow. He, he's saying to the disciples who he referenced in this text as laborers. He, he says to them, there is a harvest full of people yeah. who need to know what it is that you know. Wow. And he says, go into this harvest mm -hmm. and tell them about the Messiah. Tell them about the kingdom of God. And he tells them to pray to the Lord of the harvest. He was talking about himself. That he would send forth laborers into this harvest. And don't miss that point. Because he's saying to the disciples that he needs to send laborers into the harvest. And you would think they would catch on. You would think that they would have that Isaiah mentality and say, Here am I, Lord. Send me. That was not the mindset of the disciples. But I want to take a different avenue as I look at this text this morning. One day we'll come back and we will go exegetically through the text and walk through it and pull out all the gems. But today I want to talk about the Lord of the harvest and the kingdom of God. And I actually want to talk about what the kingdom offers. You see, that's not what we have to understand. If we are going to go out into the harvest of the world, what are we going to tell them that the kingdom of God offers them that they might actually come into the kingdom? What's so good in the kingdom? Especially 
the other. We think about it today. Most of us, when we run into people, they think they got it good right now. Amen. So, so what is it that's so good about the kingdom of God that we as laborers are to go out into the harvest and tell those within the harvest, come into the kingdom? Amen. That's what I want to talk about this morning with you. Amen. Notice in verse number one, it does say, though, I have to look at this particular phrase. He says, after these things. Exactly what things is Christ himself talking about? He's talking about that which has happened over the last couple of days. There were some interesting events that took place over the last few days prior to this particular chapter. So real quick, I want to give you a flyby over on chapter number nine. So that you can grasp a hold of not only what led up to this, but I also want you to grab a hold of exactly what Christ wants us to go out into the harvest and tell those within the harvest what the kingdom of God offers to all of those who believe and to all of those who will come in. So you look at the beginning of chapter number 9, you got to run with me real quick. We're going to go through this pretty fast. You look at the beginning of chapter 9, he begins by commissioning his 12, bringing them together, and telling them to go. And here's something that the kingdom of God gets, but I'm going to move on, because it's not three points that I want to get at. But those who come into the kingdom of God, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, according to chapter, uh, chapter 9, verse number 1, he gave them power and authority over all demons. That's one of the benefits of the kingdom of God. You receive power and authority over demonic influence in your life and even in the life of those in whom you love. The key is you're just going to have to stay focused on, what the, on the kingdom of God and the king of the kingdom. Jesus sent them that they might proclaim this gospel of the kingdom of God and that they may heal the sick and that they may deliver people from the power of of darkness. This is what we are called to do. This is the power that dwells on the inside of us. And as they were going out, as you read down through the chapter, there were two groups of people that wanted to see Jesus. His disciples had went out so much and proclaimed so much about him that there were two groups who wanted to see him. The first person that, or the first group, if you will, that was interested in who this man Jesus was, that was being proclaimed. That was giving his disciples power and authority. That was causing people to be delivered from demons. Herod the Tetrad. He wanted to know exactly who this man Jesus was. And here's why. He figured he had gotten rid of all these folks like Jesus. He figured he had stopped this Jewish movement. He figured he had ended all this when he beheaded John the Baptist for proclaiming the remissions of your sins and believing and trusting in the Messiah. He figured he had cut all that off of John the Baptist's head. So here in the Tetrach, the Tetrach says, who is this proclaiming the kingdom of God? I could have swore, verse 9, look at it. He said, I could have swore I beheaded John the Baptist so this can't be him. So who is this that I hear such things about? Not only him that was interested in who this Jesus was that they were going forth and complaining, uh, proclaiming, but there was also this crowd of people. You got to understand, if, if demonic spirits began to be delivered out of people, and, and, and if people began to be healed, you're going to draw a crowd. So eventually the crowd was drawn in, and then Jesus saw the crowd, so he began to teach the crowd, and he began to also uh, minister to them as well, regardless of what of their ministerial needs was. The Bible says that it was about 5,000 men and women that were there, plus children, of course. And so as it got late in the day, the disciples desired, and said, you might as well, you know, send them away. They got to go home so that they can eat dinner. Jesus, all we got is five loaves and two fish and all these folk. Jesus said, it ain't going to work. Jesus said, I've got it. See, this is what you got to understand. 
This is we take and proclaim to the harvest, to the world. We proclaim to them that Jesus, he got you. You don't understand, when, when you are on your last, he got you. Yeah. When you are in your greatest despair, he yeah. got you. No, no matter what it is that you need and you desire, guess what? Yeah. He got you. Yeah. This is what we go and proclaim to the harvest. Yeah. As a matter of fact, we live in a world and society who is tired of being let down by politicians and in Flint and last and, and uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, they're tired of trying to trust in them at every turn and in every two-year cycle, every four-year cycle, we're just let down and let down. And we know a Savior who says, God, this is what we take to proclaim to the harvest. Our Savior, he says, he got you. Peter realized that Jesus had it. All right. This is where Peter makes that confession. He said, this has got to be the Son of God. This has got to be the anointed one whom God said that he was sent. This is where Peter makes that great confession about Jesus being the Messiah of God. And when Jesus heard him say that, made that confession, he said, okay, let me teach you something. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes to be killed. And then he'll be raised again on that third day morning. Amen. This is what you want? Come follow me. This is what he taught them. Because this is what we are to go and to proclaim unto the harvest. This is what we are to go and let them know. We are to go and let them know that he died and rose again. And on that third day morning, he rose again from the dead. This indeed is the Messiah of God. This is what we are to proclaim. This is our message. And then really, when I look at this through my sanctified imagination, when I look at this, I see Jesus saying, if that don't get enough, if you don't really believe that I am the Messiah, then let me show you how I'm the Messiah. So you keep on reading. You see the transfiguration of Christ before their eyes. You see Jesus transforming himself unto his heavenly glory. And, and I forgot to say, because I got a friend who said that this was just a glow. I, I said, bro, what do you mean it was a glow? Y'all ever had them little sticks that you, you crack and they glow? But then the light goes out? Right. No, no, no. Jesus didn't glow. Right. Listen, there was a radiance that came about yes. himself, a light that was greater than the light. When the lightning flashes in the sky, it was a light that's greater than that. And how I know that it was a light that was greater than that? Because when the lightning flashes, it flashes and it goes away. Yeah. But when he transfigured himself before them, his glory shone in their face. Yeah. And they, they said, Lord, we worship you. They fell down before him. That lightning flickered or flashed, but it stayed there as he transfigured himself before them. Why did he have that glory? That glory that God said in the Old Testament that he would share with no man. But Jesus had this glory because he was God. Yeah. And that was the point of the transfiguration. That he would show forth himself to his disciples that they would know. And if that glory that they seen was not enough. Just like we read about the baptism. If you remember in our response to reading at the end, God spoke from heaven. Now here, this is the second time God again speaks from heaven. And if his glory was not enough for you to know that he was the Messiah, the chosen one of God, then God spoke from heaven himself and said, this is my son. Listen to him. All of this is taking place in a matter of just a couple of days up to this point. After this, they were astonished. After this, they were amazed at who Jesus was. And all through this, he is sending them out, telling them that this is all about the kingdom of God. 
But for some reason, they missed the message. You see, this is why going over this night chapter, even though I'm going through it this bad, this is why this is important. Because they've seen the power of, of his might. they see him able to cast out demons. they see him heal people. they see this transfiguration. And they were astonished by this. But they still were not focused on the kingdom of God. That's how we get sometimes. We can see God do great and mighty things. We ain't even seen a half of what he's going to do with those who enter the waters of baptism. But we can see God doing these things and they don't move us to stay, to stay fixed and focused on the kingdom of God. How do I know that they were not focused on the kingdom of God? Because right after that, guess what they were doing? They were talking to Jesus about who was the greatest. All right. They were all caught up in pride. Thinking that they are something when the Bible says we really ain't nothing. And here's what this did to them and why I want to emphasize this before we get to this, these couple of points. When they lost focus on the Messiah, when they lost focus on the King, somebody brought their child to them and they said, I, 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 I want my child to be delivered. Because the spirit comes in and seizes them and they take them and throw them here and there. And, and then it, the, uh, this, 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 this parent came up to Jesus actually and said that all of this was happening. And then they ended it by saying, this is, if you read down through there, I took them to your disciples. And they couldn't help me. Now, now let me remind you of chapter 9, verse 1. Because I'm only down in the middle of this chapter. Remember chapter 9, verse 1? Remember I said Jesus gave them power and authority, listen, over all devils. Hearing this woman just a couple of days later saying, I brought my child unto your disciples. And they couldn't do nothing. Here's why. Because they lost focus on the kingdom of God. Yeah. They lost focus on what the Messiah had in verse 1 sent them out to do. And they began to focus on self. Talking about who is the greatest. Who is better than the other. Who's going to sit at their right side. They began to look inwardly instead of looking outwardly. They looked at themselves instead of looking at others. They grew puffed up in their pride instead of exalting the Messiah of God. Jesus had to rebuke them because of this. And after rebuking them, he again delivered this child from being demon possessed. Beloved, that power lies and rests in us. We have authority. Therefore, we need to walk in that authority. Stay focused on the message. I mean, the mission. Stay focused on doing what the king has called for us to do. The Lord of the harvest has sent us out into the harvest to make disciples. And he gave us the power to do it. But when we begin to look everywhere else but where he told us to go. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm going to Jerusalem. Look at, look at what he ran into. When, when, when you look down into the chapter toward the end there. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem. And he's, he goes and he's rejected by, by those in the town and the city. But he stays focused. He stays so focused that his, his disciples are still wondering amongst themselves about following him. So even in the midst of his fickle disciples, he says, I must continue going on. And he tells them, here's, here's something that you need to know. Foxes have holes and birds of the nest have air. But the son of man, he ain't got nowhere to lay his head. But come follow me. And then this, this is that section to where one of them, you know, one of them said, okay, I'll follow you, but first I, I got to go do this first. Let me, let me go take care of my people's first. He said, if anyone places their hands upon the plow and then looks back, you're not worthy 
of the kingdom of God. We ought to place our hands to the gospel plow. And because he is the Messiah, because he has given us authority, we ought to grab a hold of the gospel plow, go into the harvest, and proclaim the message of the kingdom of God. Because that which the kingdom offers the harvest, they want and they need. But our minds, beloved, has to remain focused on the kingdom. We have to be driven by kingdom principles. We have to be driven by what the kingdom of God offers. Let me give you a really quick definition of exactly what the kingdom of God is. I want us all on one accord as I talk about what the kingdom of God offers. The kingdom of God is the sovereign rule of God, which is initiated by Christ's earthly ministry and is to be consummated when the king of the, when the kingdom of this world has become the, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That is when Christ returns. He, he set up or he started or initiated the kingdom when he came, when, when he lived his earthly ministry. That's when he set the kingdom up. But he's going to finish the kingdom when he returns. But this is the message that we must proclaim. Christ is the king of the kingdom of God. And that is the central message that we must preach. That is the central message of what we told. Why? Because that's the central message that Jesus proclaimed all through that ninth chapter. And this is what that tenth chapter is all about. It's all about carrying the message of the kingdom of God and telling those that are in the harvest exactly what the kingdom of God offers. So often, sadly, we have gone out into the harvest and we have told the, the harvest about what our traditions have to offer. We told the harvest about what our denominations have to offer. When we told the harvest about all of the good works that we have to offer, and in the midst of telling them about all the things that we have done, we have left out the key component about what the kingdom of God offers. And that's Jesus. So with the few minutes that I have left, what does the kingdom of God has to offer. I want to focus on this central thing, but outside of power and authority, outside of healing, outside of providing, outside of all those things I talked about from chapter 9, I want to talk about three specific things that the kingdom of God offers that we ought to take into the world of the harvest and proclaim about the Lord of the harvest. Number one, the kingdom of God offers Life. The kingdom of God offers us life. Amen. And that life, beloved, is within us. Yeah. Yeah. Luke chapter 17, verse 21 says this, that the kingdom of God is within you. The, the, the kingdom of God, that, that power, that authority, his rule and his reign, that which he plans to accomplish, it dwells in you. Amen. This is why we can't be the same person that we once was. That, that's why in the waters of baptism we say we go down and die with Christ, but we rise again in the newness of that life. And we walk out of the waters of baptism, out into the world, in the power of the Holy Ghost, doing what Christ has called for us to do. And then even these children who just got baptized, the kingdom of God is in you. That same power that Christ has is in you. you sadly, some people think you either got to have a specific title. You know, if you get a title, that's the noise. Yeah. You know, that's why so many people, they want a title. Yeah. You know, I really didn't care less. God does not anoint based on titles. God does not anoint based on your age. God does not anoint based on your skill set. As a matter of fact, for those of you who's in Bible study, you 
remember, he said he basically gives his anointed anointing to those who are weak. And through our weakness, he makes us strong. Through our weakness, he calls us to do great and mighty things. And why is he able to do this? Because the kingdom of God dwells in you. Not only the kingdom of God is within you, but Jesus also said this in John chapter 10, verse number 10. Jesus said that I came to give you life and life more abundant. But you know, there was something really interesting that happened right before that saying. He warns us by saying that the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So, so I see that as we've got two ways of life. We can either follow the path of the thief who comes to kill, steal, and destroy and live that life, or we can follow the more abundant life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus said that he has come to give us life and that he might give it to us more abundantly. Do you not want that abundant life? Do you not want that a life where you do great and mighty things in his name? As a matter of fact, maybe y'all didn't read this part of the Bible. Jesus said that you and I were going to do greater things than he did. He realized that his ministry was primarily focused on and centered in Galilee, in that region around Nazareth, right around Jerusalem, so that he can go off to Calvary. But he said, y'all can do greater things. Why are you going to do greater things? Because you're going to go into the further countries. You're going to go into these countries. You're going to proclaim my name. Yeah. People are going to turn away from the gods of, uh, of the Europeans. People are going to turn away from the gods of the Indians. People are even going to turn away from the gods of the Africans. They're going to turn away from all those gods, and they're going to come and worship me. And I'm going to do it through you. Yeah. Now, how does that apply to us? Amen. He said that if we go out into the harvest on Flint Park, or we go off into the harvest on Elder. But we go off into the harvest right here within the city of Flint. He will cause people to come unto himself. And how is he going to do this? If you remember, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Go out into the harvest and tell the harvest that they can have life in Jesus Christ. But not just life. Not just life, but also the kingdom of God offers hope. Let me give you a really quick biblical definition of what hope is. Hope is a earnest, confident expectation. Hope is a firm assurance regarding a thing that is unclear or unknown. We, we have this particular hope that yes, we can't see it. Yes, we don't know when it's going to come, but we therefore have that hope. And we have that hope because when he rose again from the dead and when he ascended under the heaven, he told them in Acts chapter 1, the same way that I'm going, I am going to return. And baby, you can bank on that. You can bank on the fact that he is going to return. That is where our hope is. Our hope does not lie in America getting this act together. Our hope does not lie in the European Union bringing all the nations together and we come together as one loving humanity. That's a utopia that's never ever going to come to pass. But I can guarantee you one thing that will come to pass. He will crack those skies. He will return. The dead in Christ will rise. And we with our alive and remain will be caught up in the air with the heavenly clouds together. That I can tell you is a hope that you can rest in. Hope is a fundamental component to the life of those of us who are righteous. As a matter of fact, according to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 18, it's a sure hope. The text says, surely, then you will have this future and this hope. And the Bible says that it will never fade away. It, it, again, it, it's not like this two-year cycle that our country goes through. Or this four-year cycle that our country goes through. And each time, at the end of each cycle, is something that we don't want. But this is a hope that is an everlasting hope that the Bible says will never fade away. Proverbs 23, 18 says,
says, surely there is hope. And then this hope gives us strength. The Lord, according to Proverbs chapter 28, verses 7 and 9, the Lord is our strength. Yeah, yeah. Therefore, we have hope. As a matter of fact, the, the entire context of that particular text said that the Lord is my strength and my shield. He said that my heart trusted in him, and I helped, and I was helped. Therefore, my heart greatly rejoiced, and with a song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Now, if you remember, as we're going through the book of Philippians, and in the early parts of chapter 1, who did I tell you the saints were? I mean, is it just Paul? Is it just Mary? Is it St. Peter? Is that who the saints are? Oh, okay, then who's saints? Oh, I thought I would have got around you. We are. I thought I would have got everybody to say, we are the saints of God. I thought I would have got everybody to say, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are his saints. And beloved, if you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you will put your faith and your trust in him, you will then be his anointed saint. Not because I said it, but because that's what the Bible declares. That's what the kingdom of God has to offer. It has to offer us life. It has to offer us hope. And it also offers us the truth. We live in a world that is full of lies. We live, we live in a world that we cannot believe nothing. As a matter of fact, I say this and I believe it firmly within my heart and nobody can convince me differently. If a politician is speaking, they lie. Now, 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 they might speak and sprinkle some truth in there. But let them talk long enough. You'll see it. But in Christ, as a matter of fact, let me not exempt myself. If I talk long enough off the side of my neck, I will say something that's not true as well. But let me tell you, beloved, there's nothing here in this world, word that is not true. There is nothing here that you can't bake on. If this Bible tells you you can have life, you're guaranteed that you can have life. If this book says that you can have hope, you can have hope. Why? Because this is the truth. Even Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse number 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father unless they come through me. That's why we proclaim what the Lord of the harvest has told for us to proclaim. Because there is only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. John chapter 1, verses 14 and 7, says that Jesus Christ is grace and truth. And it comes from Christ alone. So if you desire grace and if you desire truth, you must find it in Christ alone. Because alone and only in him. He is the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the word where we see him. We observe his glory. The glory of the only begotten of the Father. The glory of full of grace and of truth. He is the one to where G, uh, John said that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. All right, man. And that's what this world is looking for. The, the reason why there is so much confusion in the harvest, the reason why people are going to the left and to the right within the harvest is because they are searching for truth. The reason why those within the harvest are, are, are always constantly and continually creating new God, new ways to believe, is because they crave truth. And truth can only be found in the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. Amen. The kingdom of God has this. It has life, hope, and truth that this world needs. And Jesus is the king. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. Jesus is our king's yeah. man redeemer. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is the one in which we go to. He is the one we hope for. He is the one that we believe in. If you remember when Jesus 
in Matthew chapter number 28, after he has risen again from the, uh, from the grave, and he gives us that great commission, he said, I have risen with all authority in my hands. Go ye therefore, baptize the people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, making disciples of every yeah. single nation. And again, what does he say? He said he gives us that authority yeah. to go forth and do it. And that's what we ought to be doing. We ought to be doing exactly what the King of Glory has told us to do. We ought to be doing what the King who came from heaven down to earth to proclaim this message of the kingdom of God. This is what he said for us to focus on. This is what we ought to do. He came down to this earth. He had a mission in sight and in mind, and he completed that mission of salvation. He accomplished all that was needed to accomplish on the cross. After the cross, he was buried in the rich man's tomb. But on that third day morning, with all power, he rose again from the dead. He was and he is an incarnate son of God. As a matter of fact, he raised himself from the dead because all power rested in him. He came walking out of that tomb, living, victorious, as our Savior. He ascended back unto heaven and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he gives us this message to take unto the harvest. Whosoever to call on his name shall be saved. Beloved, we have got this message. We go unto the harvest and we say to them that the Lord is mighty to save. He saves unto the uttermost. He saves all those who call upon his name. Call upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Look unto him. Do not look at yourself, but look unto him. Look away from your religion and look unto Christ. Look away from your church and your denomination and look unto Christ. Look away from your baptism and look unto Christ. Look away from your church membership. Look away from all your good works and look unto Christ exclusively because he alone is able to save. This is what Jesus says. He said, all those who come to me, I will in no wise cast out. He loves sinners. He's a friend of sinners. He came to seek and save the least, the last, and the lost. He right. came not for the righteous, but for the unrighteous. He is that good position. He didn't come for those who were not sick, but those who need to be made well. Yeah. He came and said, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them whiter than snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them white like wool. If you will only call upon his name, he will save you. He will clothe you with his perfect garments of righteousness. Because that's what the kingdom of God has to offer unto all those who call upon his name. Perfect righteousness, life, hope, and truth. If you will believe. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you. God, we give you the glory. God, we know that if anyone this day calls upon your name, not according to what the preacher has said, but according to your word, and if any will call upon your name, you will save them this day. So, Father, we give this over to you. In Jesus' name. Please stand before the church is over.